So this panel is entitled Education and Climate Change, and the goal is to help frame the conversations of the day, providing motivation for why this topic is important, talking about the interconnectedness between the education sector and climate, and effective practices that systems are doing to drive climate action. So I am delighted to introduce the panel, who will begin by each giving some opening remarks before we launch into our discussion. First, we'll hear from Fernando Reimers. Fernando is the Ford Foundation Professor of the Practice of International Education and Director of the Global Education in Innovation Initiative at Harvard University. He is an expert in the field of global education and his research and teaching focus on understanding how children and youth, uh, how to educate children and youth so that they thrive in the 21st century. He has written or edited 45 books including a volume published in 2020 on education and climate change, and he served on the university's committee on climate education. Then we'll have Tina Grotzer. Tina is principal research scientist in education at Project Zero and a faculty member at HGSC. She's a cognitive and learning scientist, and her work considers how to leverage research towards supporting students and developing adaptive expertise to help them learn about and navigate challenges of the future. With colleague Chris Didi, she developed the EcoLearn curriculum that leverages new technologies to teach complex, complex ecosystem science concepts. And then finally, we'll hear from Laura Shifter, who's a lecturer here at HGSC. Laura is also a senior fellow at the Aspen Institute, leading the K-12 Climate Action Initiative, and she's a fellow with the Century Foundation. Previously, she worked as a policy director for Education 2020, and she also was a senior education and disability advisor for Representative George Mitchell, Miller, excuse me, George Miller, on the Committee on Education and Labor, and she served as an education fellow for Senator Chris Dodd on the Senate uh, Help Committee. So, Fernando, would you please get us started? Thank you, Bridget. Uh, I'm delighted to see your leadership on this topic in our school and to be part of this event where we're beginning these conversations. And I'm very glad to see so many of you uh, coming to think together about how can teachers, schools, universities, and education systems help our students develop the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes that they need to engage creatively and intelligently in confronting the very issues that Bridget talked about. Now, I hope those of you here are going to take the time to read the university report on climate education, um, because I think it illustrates what any educational institutions could do. Get a group of your own people together and ask, what is it that we want our students to learn, and how do we mobilize ourselves to do things in the short term and in the long term? And, my, and then put some leadership and some money behind it to execute on that strategy. So my hope is that Harvard's report will serve as an example to many of you, and frankly, I hope it'll be of use to other universities. In fact, nothing would help us get a little urgency behind it more than if that little university in New Haven took out our report, made it better, and acted faster than, than, we, than we do on, on those recommendations. Now, there are two ideas in that report that I'd like to highlight today. The first is that in order to make a difference on climate change, Harvard needs to partner with other institutions, such as schools and districts or other universities, that we are too small to actually make a dent on this issue unless we reach to the rest of society. And that, of course, is a theme that is not new to our school, but it may be somewhat need to the, new to the larger university. The second idea I want to highlight is the conclusion of the report, and I'm going to quote, that says, we should recognize and resist the risk of addressing the complexity of climate change by incorporating it in shallow ways that lead our students to end up engaging in superficial advocacy rather than in the essential but harder intellectual and creative work of developing solutions to the complicated challenges and to assessing the trade-offs, like how much are we willing to pay to reduce our own carbon footprint. Now, the idea that education institutions must first do the work of thinking clearly about the intellectual competencies that our students should develop so they can create solutions is one that is relevant, of course, to any educational institutions, whether you're a teacher in a classroom, a principal in a school, a superintendent, or a secretary. And I want to argue that the reason many well-intended efforts to educate about climate change have not been successful, I want to repeat, We've done plenty of things to educate about climate change, but many of them are not only um, unsuccessful, they are counterproductive in producing people who become cynical to their own ability to address this challenge. Um, is, I think, because we haven't really 
thought through what are the skills that we need to be developing. Now, a couple of years ago, I took the time to read hundreds of studies that had actually evaluated the effectiveness of climate education programs. And the results of that work are included in the book that Bridget mentioned, which is an open access publication. You can download it for free. The title is Education and Climate Change. The first chapter in that book is a synthesis of that review of the existing research. And what that chapter shows is that there are many and growing, as Bridget mentioned, efforts reflected in commitments from governments, reflected in curriculum standards, in innovative programs. But many of them share a shortcoming. They are primarily about educating students on the facts of climate change. They are about transmitting knowledge, not about developing skills to do anything about the problem. Knowledge transmission is, of course, essential. A recent survey, which was administered by the National Center for Science Education, to a representative sample of, of U.S. high school science teachers shows that while 75% of those teachers address climate change in their classes, only half of them do it in a way that is aligned with the current scientific consensus on the matter. And when these teachers are asked to rate their own knowledge on domains which are essential to teach about climate change, only 28% say that they are competent to do that. Now, so clearly, we need to do a better job sharing knowledge with teachers. But when I was reading those studies that evaluated the effectiveness of those programs, I at the same time read the most recent report of the International Panel on Climate Change. And I asked, so what's the connection between what those education programs are trying to do and the argument in this report about what we need to do to address the challenge? And the answer is simply not very much. Many of those programs, the education programs, are based on a dated idea developed in the 1970s about how we are to address climate change, which is basically if we all are responsible consumers and we recycle, we'll address that issue. And we now know that we will not get to 1.5, zero degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels simply through recycling or responsible consumption. And so recycling is certainly important. I don't want to suggest that we shouldn't do it, but it's far from, from, uh, from sufficient. So very few of those programs that have been evaluated acknowledge the reality that the skills that can help us adapt are urgent because the climate change already baked into the atmosphere is going to produce disruptions for the rest of our lives, even if we succeed at beginning to slow down the pace of climate change. Now, in reviewing that research, I found very interesting experimental studies which combine teaching the science of climate change with what I would call civic education in providing students the opportunity to collaborate with others in doing something uh, about climate change. And the combination of those approaches when compared in experimental studies with simply teaching the science produce very comparable levels in terms of knowing the facts, but very different dispositions. The students who only learned the facts were so overwhelmed by them that they didn't have any hope that they could make a difference. It was only the students who had been given an opportunity to engage in an activity where they could do something that developed some sense of self-efficacy and some hope that we could address this problem. So you all, as educators, think about the implication of that finding and perhaps about the value of going to the library and sitting down and saying, let's read what has been done and what has been evaluated about this. So based on reading that research, I decided to do a very simple experiment. I invited some of my students to engage with one educational institution, a school in Guatemala, a center to teach out-of-school youth in Pakistan, different places, and to work with them in figuring out in what way was climate change impacting that jurisdiction and what knowledge, what skills, what attitudes should students develop that in that context made a difference. And then work for a semester developing a curriculum in partnership with them. And the result of that work is also published in that book. You can read it as examples. But the main idea I want to share from that is imagine if in each of the 28,000 universities that exist in the world, in each one of them, a group of students and a group of faculty actually took the time to work with teachers, to work with schools, developing curriculum 
supporting the implementation of that curriculum and evaluating what works. Imagine the progress that we could make. Now, I think that is the opportunity in front of each one of us. That's why I'm excited that you're here. And I think it's an opportunity that Harvard's new commitment to this issue and the generous gift of the Salada family perhaps will help us seize. Thank you so much, yeah. Fernanda. Yeah. Tina? Thank you. So first, thank you to Bridget and I guess I'm being heard here. Thank you to Bridget and to the organizers of the panel today. Really so important to see this gathering and this initiative taking off. Um, at yesterday's Salata Institute launch, we saw people from all different disciplines on the stage. And as I looked at those people there, what it said to me is, that's the role of educators, to get those people onto the stage. And that presents a very different view of what climate change education entails than we've really thought about over the past 10, 20 years. Um, so it really does require, for this existential and urgent problem, an interdisciplinary and um, a, a grouping, grouping and collective endeavor, but also it's a highly complex problem space. And so as we think about the urgency of the problem, we all want to do and we all want to act, but it's really education that is the lever that sits between what do we do now and how do we get to deeply informed action. So the research that I've been doing over the last number of years has been on how we reason about complex forms of causality. And it shows that the human perceptual system um, tends to pare down, simplify, satisfy, look for the most efficient solutions. And that gets us into trouble. Um, so as we think about the shortcomings in our own thinking and how we got here, we need to think bigger and broader in terms of what we do educationally. Um, this is a book that summarizes some of that research. It's available online, and there's also curriculum from the classrooms that we worked on um, in relation to this work. But despite the many challenges to follow on from what Fernando has talked about, there are some real points of promise that I want to just highlight briefly. And I'm going to just do a quick sampling of five. I think that we are seeing more recently in the past decade, expanded views of what needs to be taught. Educators, researchers, and funding agencies are realizing that it's not enough to teach the science, that we need to do much more than that. And um, one of the labs that I run here is called the Next Level Lab, and as part of that work, we are embarking on creating an inventory of what's needed in the workforce for the future in terms of thinking green. And we've started in a very <coughs> expansive way, working with educators in K-12, but also people in workforce development, saying what kinds of things should be included. And the list is long, everything from design thinking to thinking about how to be an individual, you know, a, an earthling on planet Earth. How do we think collectively? How how do we use different ways of knowing to inform our sense of um, our connectedness and our really joint future on this planet? The second sort of, and I'm glad to say more about that, that particular inventory if there's time <laughs> later. <laughs> um, we're also seeing really, really important attention to the social and emotional issues related to learning about and thinking about climate. Um, the, the challenges that young people face. And researchers like um, Maria Ohala and others have really teased apart what does hope mean? How do we help young people walk between this sort of balance of hope and despair against, uh, I'm sorry, despair and, and apathy to hope and promise and what we can do and sort of action. Um, also, you know, medical folks like Dr. Ari Bernstein over at the School of Public Health, who's done a lot to think about as educators, what do we have to do in the details to help them walk that walk in a healthy and safe and resilient way? Um, the other thing I think that we're seeing that makes a really big difference is we're seeing a really nice alignment of the, the need to engage in action-oriented curriculum 
with problem-based and project-based learning. So these are pedagogies that we know are really powerful. And when we put them in, in conversation with our need to engage young people in action to be healthy, um, it's a win-win. So for example, a shout out to our colleagues at the um, the Gulf, Maine, Gulf of Maine Institute and their work with the Billion Oysters Project. So imagine 8,000 plus young people in the New York City schools and they, are, they have oyster nurseries and they are raising baby oysters and measuring them and taking population counts and, and then they're putting them back into the bays and they are uh, monitoring their growth and eventually they're actually selling those oysters to the local restaurants who are now, they have local oysters back on their menu. But in the meanwhile, these oysters are cleaning the, the water. And so all the way around, there's great math and science there. And the kids are really engaged in an, an important endeavor and one where they can see concrete outcomes. Um, the other really sort of big thing, I think, is that we're seeing a greater focus on bringing the collectivity of wisdom about sustainability forward, on putting different ways of knowing and conversation with one another. So increasingly, people are turning to what we call pluralistic epistemologies. For example, and my apologies for the pronunciation, um, Etta Patamumak is a um, Mcmau um, framework for two-eyed seeing, where indigenous and Western knowledge are envisioned to work alongside one another as proposed by tribal elders. Resources such as the North Dakota Native American Essential Understandings, teachings of our elders' resources, and honoring tribal legacies bring these indigenous perspectives in very concrete ways to, to kids all over. Um, we're also seeing technology support for authentic learning in the classroom when it's not possible to get them out you know, in New York City on the Bay or wherever else. So some of you um, may be familiar with the eco-learn work uh, that Bridget mentioned. So this is a virtual world where students come in and they're able to explore and engage with environmental problems or issues. They need to develop the awareness that something's happening. They have to notice. That's the first step. Then they need to be able to deal well with it, and then they need to be inclined. So they're developing sensitivity, ability, and inclination. And as researchers, we're able to study what they do and what's hard for them, and then use that information to improve the instructional resources. So really important, and those actually those resources are available for free online. They're NSF funded. And then, you know, Bridget asked me to say a couple words about what we're seeing in classrooms. We see states stepping up and putting initiatives in place, such as New Jersey and California. The next generation science standards do introduce climate change into the classroom, not to the extent that I would hope. I would want to push it further, um, but it's a start. Um, and we also see many, many teachers on the ground teaching climate concepts. But I think it's important not to underestimate the challenges that teachers face, because the details here are going to matter. Um, one of the puzzles about moving from informed action, I mean, towards informed action is the difficulties in those details. And so, for example, in states like New Jersey, the, they've gone across the curriculum broadly, and they're asking everyone to teach it, and through the levels, really, really important. Um, but th then there's a lot of creativity, so, you know, for the teachers who feel comfortable, but some teachers may feel less supported. And then, you know, in California, a more structured top-down approach, some teachers may feel a little frustrated by that, but more support at all levels. So ultimately, these kinds of decisions matter because they result in inequities in the long run when teachers don't have the support. It gets amplified. So, you know, I think that we really need continued research in education. We need continued research on learning in schools. And we also need that important translational and choreogra choreography um, involved in taking those findings and understandings and creating resources that go back. It's one of the reasons why the, um, the group here at the Kennedy School, the Subject to Climate group, um, makes me smile <laughs> because they're doing that hard work every single day. So I'm thrilled that we're starting this conversation here. Um, for the year and to learn together, and I really look forward to those conversations and where we take it. 
Great. Thank you so much, Tina. And I want to notice that uh, Fernando is modeling what I said this would be. It's a learning experience. He's up here taking notes, and I have been as well. Um, and Tina already gave you a preview. There's lots of questions. We will get to discussion. She got to jump on some of them um, as we were preparing for this. But Laura, I want to give you plenty of time because you are straddling both Hugsy and work that you're doing at Aspen. So. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate the thank you for hosting this event and having this conversation. So um, I think it's a really important step that the Ed School is taking in this. So four years ago, climate change was not an important issue to me. It was something I cared about, something that I believed was an important issue to address. But working in education and education policy, there are a lot of problems, and there are a lot of things to address, and there are a lot of um, things that pull on your time. And the way that I talk about my shift over to this is there are three days in my life that have fundamentally altered my life. If other people have had these experiences, they know them one day you're one person, the next day something happens, and then you become somebody else. For me, it was the day my oldest daughter was born and I became a different person as a mother. Um, the day that we lost my brother-in-law suddenly, and I learned for the first time the overwhelming power of grief. And then in October of 2018, the day that the UN report came out on climate change on 1.5 degrees warming, I was in my basement playing with my three kids, and I got news alert, news alert, news alert. We have a decade left to address, to address climate change and avoid the most devastating effects. And in that moment, all my feelings of motherhood and grief converged as I was looking at my children, and all the problems I had been thinking about the day before felt meaningless. It felt like we could have the best education system in the world, and it wouldn't matter if the full impacts of climate change took hold. I spent a week feeling utterly depressed about the state of our world and walking around with that depression, and then I decided I just had to shift and do whatever it was that I could to work on these issues. I looked at job postings at the Sierra Club. I looked at job postings at the Environmental Defense Fund, and nothing was really sitting right in terms of what those jobs would entail. A couple months later, Jay Inslee announced he was running for president, and he said on day one of his administration, he would ask all the departments to submit their plans to address climate change, and it hit me. I didn't have to go to a different field to do work on climate change. I could bring my expertise in education, in education policy, and try to advance an initiative there. Um, and really think about how can, you know, working in the education policy sector, people weren't talking about intersections with climate change. How can we facilitate dialogue and use those relationships to build some initiative to do that? Um, I spent a year talking to everyone and anyone I knew. They'd introduce me to more people, and I talked to more people. Um, I talked to these folks here on this panel. Um, and I found my way over to the Aspen Institute to launch K-12 Climate Action. I spoke with former Education Secretary John King and former Governor and EPA Administrator Christine Todd Whitman. They saw the importance of this work right away and jumped on board. We launched a commission of 22 education, civil rights, um, youth leaders, superintendents, people on the ground doing this work to learn about the opportunities to engage the education sector in action on climate change, to learn about the great work that is already occurring across this country. So they held a listening tour. Um, and based on that listening tour, they, did, they released an action plan to outline comprehensively what the education sector can do. What is the education sector's role in taking action on climate change? This is focused domestically, um, and they make recommendations for policymakers at the federal, state, and local level to really take action, thinking about what the education sector can do to mitigate its impact on the environment, adapt and build resilience to climate impacts ahead, support teaching and learning to prepare um, the next generation to advance a more sustainable, resilient, and equitable society, and recognizing the fact that this issue is completely intertwined with issues of equity and social justice, emphasizing that in this moment of transition, we actually have an opportunity to advance equity and center those who are most subjected to educational inequities to receive the benefits of healthier, sustainable learning environments in the future. Um, so this action plan we released last year with the release of this action plan, 
we actually then started hearing from people in other sectors saying, hey, we need to do the same thing. So we heard from people in early childhood saying that they wanted to do the same thing as what we've done with K-12. We've heard from people now in higher ed who have been interested in building a similar initiative in higher ed. And we've heard from people in children's media as well that want to think about how they can integrate climate change and climate solutions more into children's media. And so actually just last month, we've relaunched as a broader initiative, This is Planet Ed, to grapple with these issues more. So we are now working in four buckets. Um, really thinking about how we can unlock the power of education to advance climate solutions. Um, and I want to leave with just three points to hit home on this. The reason why this happen needs to happen now is it's urgent. I think one of the things that really stood out to me yesterday at the Salada Institute launch was the first slide. This is the greatest single challenge of our time. And so the time is now for us to do this. You know, Bridget, you outlined all the impacts that we're seeing. The flooding in Pakistan is devastating. Hurricane Ian is devastating. The impacts are here today. Students, families, and communities are feeling them all across the country and the world. And that is only going to increase. So the time is now. Education is going to be critical to solutions. When the UN released a report this past spring, the UN Secretary General came out and he said, the commitments that we have by countries right now are putting us firmly on track to an unlivable planet. We have the scientific technical solutions to address this issue and what we have lacked is the social and political will. All of us here at the Ed School believe in the power of education to change social and political will and to really lead that effort. And so education has to be critical to advance solutions. There was a 2019 poll that was done that said 14% of teens felt that they learned a lot about climate solutions in school currently. If we're talking about the greatest challenge of our time, that number needs to be 100. The other thing just to add to is that there's benefits to education in doing this work. There's benefits to education in engaging students. You know, we saw the NAEP scores decline. There's been a lot of talk about students being disengaged in school. Potentially why they're disengaged is because what they're learning in school is not matching the reality of what they're seeing outside of school. So this provides opportunities to engage students and meet them where they are. This provides opportunities to advance equity. This provides opportunities to build healthier, sustainable learning environments for students and educators to breathe better air in their schools, to you know, get on buses that don't have diesel fumes. So there's benefits to education in doing this work as well. So I'm really encouraged by the fact that we're having this conversation today and leading this effort forward and look forward to seeing all the work that the Ed School is going to do in the year ahead too. Great. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, and thank you, everyone who's joining us. We have a little bit of time. We're going to we're gonna take about 20 minutes for a bit of discussion. Um, so if I can get that going. Um, Fernando, I want to start with you, but I hope others will join in. Mm -hmm. On the Committee for Climate Education, you did a bit of a review of what's happening here at HGSE and also learned uh, other examples at Harvard. I'm wondering if you could share some of the things that jumped out at you as being particularly promising? Well, what, one of the things that we observe is that there are a fair amount of opportunities for students to learn about the science of climate change, and low-hanging fruit is just making that visible for all students. It's in the nature of our university that we are a universe, but it's not easy to find all the good things that are happening here. So there are already opportunities, low-hanging fruit, in terms of making visible for most students what exists. I also think that in, in, in participating in that report, one of the things we did was to talk to our own colleagues, we talk to you, talk to our faculty, and there is interest on the part of a number of faculty at the Ed School already in addressing these yeah. issues. I just learned yesterday, uh, serendipitously, through one of his students, that one of my colleagues is actually engaging his students in uh, finding solutions to educate our own students at the Ed School better about climate change. And I think, again, low-hanging fruit is to make that, provide those opportunities for mutual recognition so we know, okay, who else is interested in that? Who else could I be working with? Um, you, know, you gave me the example of Joel's deeper, lear deeper learning yeah, class. That's it. Yeah. I got to meet some of the students. Maybe you could share that. Th that that's the one I was referring okay. to. That's nope. exactly Great. the example I was referring so to. So yeah. they're working on projects where I'm going to be getting a series of recommendations about what HGSE can do, and they already shared notes about tabling that they've done with, with their uh, colleagues. Yeah. And so, I mean, 
this is such a vast institution that there are many opportunities for us if we can connect the dots across the various departments to do um, extraordinary things. Um, we're not great at connecting the dots because our structure of incentives pulled us towards our own home departments. But um, my hope is that this initiative and this institute is going to have sufficient heft to kind of force us to engage with colleagues. And for example, I know that we have developed curriculum uh, for high school, not, not we at the Ed School, our colleagues in the sciences have developed curriculum for teachers to learn more about the science of climate change. I've looked at it, it's a great effort, but it's an effort that would have benefited tremendously from what is known here about what works in professional development. This notion that you can just distribute nuggets of wisdom on the video and that this is going to change the shared practices of teachers fail to use things that are common knowledge in, in this school. So that's just a simple example of how we could take an existing asset and then add value by bringing other people to the conversation. And my, my sense is that our school in particular, because this business of engaging with the field is not considered a distraction, but it's part of our work, we can be very helpful. The, the reality of this committee in putting together the report is that it did, didn't take us very long to realize that even if we succeeded in doing a better job at educating every single Harvard student better on climate change, that really would be a drop in the, in the bucket because, as you and both of you have said, this is an issue that involves behavioral change of 8 billion humans. And this institution, with all of our $50 billion, from the grand scheme of things, is really inconsequential to that unless we figure out an intelligent way to partner with others. That's why I think this conversation is important. That's why I think the participation of the school in the larger Harvard effort is especially important. So I'm, I'm excited that this, can, this might be good, not just for climate change, might, might be good to model what universities should be doing at a time when more and more people ask, what good do universities do for society anyway? Well, if we could show that we actually can do something about the most critical existential challenge facing humanity, that would go a long way. Okay, so let me broaden and ask a slightly harder question. So the great news is that there are promising practices. There are things we know, um, knowledge and expertise that we can apply to solving this problem. But we also know we can discover all the most amazing things in the world and research doesn't necessarily get used in, in schools and communities. So what is it gonna take to bridge that gap? What's, what's your advice? How will we help schools, districts, communities to apply some of the things that we've been learning. I think I'm going to um, reiterate something Fernando said to lead into to my, to my answer to that. But I think um, coordinating the efforts that we have and learning from those with whom we are working is key. So Michelle, I'm going to call you out over there. So last year, Michelle said, I, don't, I want to know what's going on here, and I want to coordinate the efforts across the university. You know, this is happening, and that's happening, and that's happening. So how do we bring those opportunities to people the day they walk in the door? So this year, we had an orientation for students um, to help them know what resources are here and how they can be connecting the dots. And that's been amazing, amazingly generative, but that comes from a student from last year. So sort of handing that on. And I, and I think that that spirit needs to come to the work that we do in classrooms. Teachers know their students. They know the students they're working with. They know their local environments. It is really the um, curriculum efforts that take those um, forms of expertise and put them in conversation with what we know from the research and some of the resources that we have here at Harvard that I think are most generative. The work that I've done has been at the intersection of learning and the cognitive science and the learning sciences and really saying, you know, what if we push here? What if we push there? And then they push back on me and they make it even more real. And that's where we get some of the best curriculum and the best solutions. So I'm just going to say that we need to continue working with the field. We need to work with our former students who are out there doing amazing work. Um, and I think that that will bring forth the best of who we are if we can make that connection. Okay. Great, Laura, could I bring you into this? With the report, how has it been received and, and how are you helping districts and leaders bring about action? I think the report has been received really well. I think there's a lot of opportunity um, for action that is already occurring. And I know the next panel after this will highlight some school districts that are doing some great work out there. 
Um, and we need to continue to get this out more. There's still not enough awareness. There's still too many people within the education sector who don't see climate change as their work or in their lane. Largely, I think, because they don't know what to do um, or how to advance solutions within what they do. Um, and so our hope is to kind of continue to bring this out more and help educators learn how they can talk about climate change. So just even thinking about it, you know, two terms that are used a lot in climate change, mitigation and adaptation, and thinking about how educators can think about, okay, climate mitigation means how am I impacting the environment? What is it that I can do to reduce that impact on the environment? Adaptation means um, how are we going to be impacted by climate change and what can we do to adapt and build resilience? And so helping educators continue to understand these terms, learn about it in terms of what impacts them in schools, what impacts their students, their families, and their communities is still an effort that we need to all do. Um, and it's something that I know our commissioners, uh, Secretary John King, Governor Whitman, um, the teachers union presidents, the you know superintendent of Chicago, they're all working to talk about this issue as well. And so the report has been well received. It still needs to get out there more. And so one plug that I have to any of you all here is within where you work, if you can help push this out too to help more educators see um, the ways that they can take action on climate. Sure. And one thing you haven't mentioned actually for schools, you can actually save quite a bit of money. Oh, this yeah. can be incredibly cost effective yep. if even all you're thinking about is dollars and cents. Yes. So the energy savings have a lot of opportunity and there's actually um, federal investment now that can help school districts access money, access tax credits that are in the Inflation Reduction Act. Oftentimes schools don't think about being able to access tax credits, but one of the things that they put in the Inflation Reduction Act was something called direct pay, which allows for non-taxable entities to actually get funding directly to do this work. So there's money out there, there's money on the table. The investments being made now can actually then save districts annually um, on their budget. There's a school uh, in Arlington, Virginia. It's a net zero energy school. So there are places out there that show how this can be done. It's a net zero energy school. It produces as much energy as it consumes. There's a tower right in the center of the school. It's called a power tower. Students see every day when they enter the building how much energy their uh, building is producing and consuming. Students then can see, oh, let's all turn off the lights at the same time in our building on this day and see that consumption drop. They'll talk about when it's a cloudy day, how does that change the amount that they're producing from their solar panels on the roof. And that building saves the school district over $100,000 annually on energy costs because they don't have those energy costs. So there are fossil fuel free schools out there. And by the way, that building, you talk to the architect, you talk to the designer, did not cost more to build. It was about being smart in the way they did it. So the angle of how, you know, where the building sat had to be maximized for ensuring solar panels mm -hmm. were facing the south so they could generate as much energy as possible. So it's just about thinking about things differently and the benefits build upon themselves. Great. So as Laura uh, just alluded to, so we have the Inflation Reduction Act. We have the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. We have leftover funds from the American Rescue Plans funds. So it's a unique time where there actually are resources. Mm -hmm. But you hear from schools that they're not actually using them, that they're not sure what to do with them. And this two weeks ago, we had a convening on COVID recovery and what's needed to support learning acceleration and student wellness in the teaching profession. I wonder if you could share, what's your advice? What would you say to schools and districts and educators? What would you hope to see during this moment of time when there actually are resources available? I, I wonder if in education we sometimes hope to solve problems at a scale at which they cannot be solved. And I have learned working with systems and networks of schools that the school, even the larger school, is often a very small unit at which you could develop, for example, a really effective transformational climate science curriculum. You don't have enough staff. But I think what a single school cannot do, a network of schools aided by a university can do amazing things. And I think part of what we need is a mind shift on how do we organize ourselves to do this work. That's why I'm so insisting on the power 
of university school partnerships, a topic that I address in this book and that the UNESCO Commission on the Future of Education kind of pushes, because I think it is that scale and that integration across institution that is going to help us develop um, truly transformational climate change curriculum. I want to mention one thing. I want to add one thing to what has been said. Um, the literature on climate change, of course, talks about the need to uh, adapt to climate change because this is built into the atmosphere. We're going to live with the consequences. So that means figuring out how do we prevent mm -hmm. fatalities when there are floods, when mm -hmm. coastal levels rise, when we have extreme temperatures. The need to mitigate it kind of slow down. But I think that literature also talks about the possibility of reverting climate change. And that involves largely science, engineering, and invention. There are really cool things happening by way of putting nanoparticles in space that can deflect some radiation, by uh, research in developing safer ways of nuclear energy, for example. And, and that's why I think it's important. That's what I meant when I said educators should be asking themselves, what's the full range of capacities that we need to develop among our children? And it has to go beyond understanding that this is here. And yes, there are all these terrible things that we have to adapt to. But they should include also stimulating them. For example, Bill Gates developed a passion some years ago on toilets. It's really smart because he realized that the conventional toilet, if we were to expand that technology to the entire world population, it would have catastrophic events on sustainability because of the amount of water that it would require. So he actually approached a number of universities. I think he came here and he said, would you help me design new toilets? And universities turned him down. They said, we're not interested in the kind of problem. And think about it for a moment. We're not interested in solving one of the most important challenges. <clears throat> and he finally got some people to do really clever work producing a different kind of toilet. Well, this is part of what our educational institutions should be doing, equipping students with the skills to be inventive, whether it's inventing toilets or safe nuclear energy, whatever it is, in hope that we might actually be able to revert these things, not just about adapting to it. Anyway. Well, in, in relation to that, we know a lot about how to teach design thinking. We know a lot about how to help people turn problems inside out and look at them in different ways, to analyze the assumptions that they're holding, even if they've lived with them every single day. So <clears throat> how do you think about your daily activities and say, well, should I really be flushing all the potable water down the toilet? <laughs> Things like that. So I, I agree. I think that that's as we start to think about what does it entail to teach young people about, a, about living sensitively in our climate, um, given the crises we're involved in, it really is bigger than it's, it's design thinking. It is thinking about our resources as limited. It's engineering. It's all kinds of places where we could, we know a lot about teaching these things and we could be employing these things. And in doing that, we bring more people to the table and we are building upon different kinds of strengths and talents. But I do think that we often ask educators to Make revisions just like we would um, if you, as, as if we were changing the wheel on a moving car. And so we need to give them spaces to talk about these things. We need to offer them effective models. One of the reasons I love the Billion Oyster Project is because teachers get it. They see it and go, oh, that works in this way, and this way, and this way. And they see how something like that can be powerful. And then they bring it to their local context and start saying, what can I do that's like that, analogically speaking? So I think, you know, I think there's a lot of promise for expanding what we think of in terms of teaching to climate um, education, and also to really giving teachers opportunities to do that thinking with us. And I, I also think, too, in addition to thinking about equipping the students is a recognition that many of the adults that are in the system might not have the knowledge and awareness mm -hmm. of, of yeah. what they can do yeah. to do this. And that's a critical thing that we can do in terms of helping them understand the federal opportunities that are available right now. You know, I think providing that technical assistance, educators will jump on it. One success story from this past um, year is there's $5 billion allocated within the infrastructure bill to help schools transition to electric school buses. It's important to know $5 billion is not going to be sufficient to actually transition the 480,000 school buses that are out there, but it'll catalyze action. 
Um, and they did the first round of funding. This um, They had the applications come out this summer. They were planning to release $500 million of that funding. They got applicants from every state across the country. And based on those applications, they actually decided to double the amount to $1 billion and announced the first awards yesterday or two days ago on um, who's getting these grants. So schools are ready to do this work if they know how to do it. So letting them know, how can you use American Rescue Plan funds to do this work? Making sure that if you're replacing your HVAC system, you're not adding one that's going to be based on fossil fuels. It'll be in the system then for 20 years, but you're actually thinking how to do this wisely. And then helping people know with the case studies that you're not just integrating that into your school, but you're using that as a living lab that mm -hmm. students can then engage and learn about that transition as well. Okay, with the last two minutes of our panel, um, last question. We have many wonderful students here. We have students watching us online. We have alumni who are also joining us. What's your one piece of advice to them if they want to get involved? Read the report of the International Panel on Climate Change and then ask which competencies would be helpful for students to gain that would make a difference and how can I help? You will remember that about a decade ago, we hosted Malala Yousafzai here. And when she came onto the stage in Sanders Theater, we all stood up and we gave her a standing ovation and she said, please, please, I don't want you to think that I've done anything extraordinary. It's just that in a context of grave injustice, the actions of one person can make a big difference. And I think that's what we see with the example of Greta Thunberg, this woman who at the age of 12 convinced her parents to, to change their lifestyle so it would reduce the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. At the age of 15 was advocating in front of the Swedish Congress. At the age of 16 began a global school movement uh, asking for changes. The, the actions of a single person will make a big difference. And that is each and every one of us in this room. Mm -hmm. Collaborate with us. Look for ways that we can learn together towards new possibilities and new solutions. And um, let's take it from there. And that's you know, an invitation both to current teachers and to our former students and our current students. So it's really working together. Laura? And I would say talk about it. I think uh, we can't underestimate the importance of talking about this issue. It can be scary and it can be hard. Um, but we have to keep talking about it. There's too much silence about what it is that we're facing all across the country and across the world. But not being afraid to lead these conversations and lead with values, lead with things that are shared values and recognize that this is a personal issue. Oftentimes we can talk about it and it feels like it's science or you're using, you know, terms like decarbonization that can be off-putting to people, but ultimately our ability to thrive depends on a stable climate, and that is something that will impact all of us personally where we are. So don't be afraid to talk about it. So please join me in thanking Fernando, Tina, and Laura for this first panel.